Hello and good afternoon. CTS 265, Section 840 students for the Fall 2016 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This is the CCMP route course, and this afternoon's video tutorial is going to be on Cisco Learning Labs activity number 14, Discovery 14, where we're going to begin our conversation about OSPF version 3. We're also going to get to take a look at the RFC 5838 uh, add-on to OSPF version 3, and that is OSPF v3 with address families. So, uh, OSPF for IPv6 uh, is originally defined here, or I should say is defined in uh, RFC 5340. Uh, it obsoletes 2740, uh, and again, this is a fantastic read uh, on OSPF for IPv6. You can see right here, uh, John T. Moy is one of the authors of this RFC, and that name should ring a bell from RFC 2328, uh, and you've got it. John Moy uh, is the creator of OSPF, basically. Uh, so some amazing information inside not just this RFC, but also RFC 2328. And then we're also going to talk about RFC 5838. We're going to convert our configuration, and we're going to take a look at address families and OSPF v3. Now, remember in class, we talked about the differences when we compared and contrasted EIGRP named mode and OSPF v3 with address families. Now, remember that both of these are going to be broken down when, once we get into the, uh, the router OSPF v3 and we put in the process ID, or if we were to say router EIGRP CCIE and get into that named mode, when we type in address family IPv4 unicast or address family IPv6 unicast, that puts us into sort of a sub-configuration mode under the routing protocol global config area where we're going to be configuring the specific address families. Now, the significant difference between the two is that when we run OSP, uh, when we run EIGRP uh, in named mode, where we go into the different address families, we're basically running dual stack. So we have sort of two independent EIGRP configuration sections. And if we're doing IPv4, we have IPv4 addresses. If we're doing IPv6, we're going to have IPv6 addresses. When we talk about OSPF v3 in address family mode, and remember, this is specific to address family mode, we're going to be able to advertise IPv4 information, but the way that it's going to work is that the transport of that information is actually going to be the IPv6 uh, IPv6 IP protocol. And so this kind of is going to guide us into our conversation when we talk about um, multi-protocol BGP and how you can do with BGP. You can have IPv4 over v6. You can have v6 over v4. And so just think of it like this. We've got our OSPF v3. And remember, this is the critical component here with address families. If I'm not using address families, I cannot configure OSPF version 3 to advertise IPv4 information. It has to be OSPF version 3 with address families. And think of it as IPv6 is going to be my transport, my carrier, my transport, my transport company, my truck, right? And this is what's going to be carrying my NLRI, right? Those prefixes that are being advertised into OSPF. And inside of that OSPF v3 with address families truck, I can have an IPv6 passenger. You know, it could be 2001 colon whatever, whatever, whatever. But I can also advertise IPv4 NLRI. So this could be 2.3.4.5. And again, it's all being done as a single OSPF version 3 process. And the transport or the carrier is IPv6, right? And it's just where these passengers are simply riding on the back or inside the truck of IPv6 here. And that is how this information is being advertised between the OSPF neighbors. And so hopefully that visual gives you kind of a better idea uh, as to what we're talking about when we say that you can advertise a different address family's information over IPv6. And that's what it allows us to do. So let's jump into the lab here. 
uh, and they want us to start out on router one. And if we take a look at the diagram, what would you say router one is here? As an OSPF router, what kind of a router would this be? Exactly. It's going to be an ABR because it has one interface in the backbone area and at least one or more interfaces, in our case two, interfaces in non-area zero areas. So we're going to jump on to router one, and I hope it doesn't continue to do that. Let me shrink the size down here. Let's see if that helps us out. There we go. All right, so we're going to get into global config. Now, I'm going to go ahead and incorrectly say IPv6 router OSPF, and the process ID is going to be one. Now, remember, the process ID is locally significant uh, in this context. And what do we get? We get an error message telling us IPv6 routing is not enabled. So I need to come back and say IPv6 unicast routing, right? Because if we're going to be running an IPv6 routing protocol, we need to make sure that IPv6 unicast routing, which is disabled by default, we need to make sure that that is enabled. So we saw the interfaces earlier. So one of the things I like to do is not password, but we're going to come back and say IPv6 router OSPF1. The first thing I always like to do is passive interface default. Once I've done that, I'm then going to say no passive interface. We've got Ethernet 00, Ethernet 01, and then we've got a serial interface out there, 20. So we no passive those interfaces, and let's also set the router ID to something that's going to be a little easier to remember. And keep in mind that IPv6, that that is not an IP address. That is a 32-bit value that is being represented in dotted decimal notation so it looks exactly like an IP address but it is not an IP address so keep that in mind right that is simply the router ID and the value is being displayed and entered in in 32-bit dotted decimal notation all right so we've got our router ID in there we've got our interfaces that have been placed in the passive mode so let's take a look here what are the differences between OSPF v2 and v3? Well, you saw that we did the passive interface, uh, uh, the passive interface default. Uh, you've seen that we've got the maximum paths, just like we did with OSPF version 2. We can redistribute things, which is what we're going to be covering this coming week. We've got the router ID that we can set. So again, all of the, actually, the majority of the commands are here, but what is the one command that you do not see here that you would typically see right there between maximum paths and no. Exactly. Where is the network statement, right? Where did it go? Well, OSPF version 3 uh, is, for all intents and purposes, it is a complete rewrite of OSPF, right, in order to support IPv6. And there are some significant changes uh, when we talk about the LSA structure and how things work, uh, but this is one of those things. There is no network statement. So in other words, I can't say network and then you know 2001 colon DB8 colon blah, 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 blah. We can't do that. Network statement's not there. In fact, you probably would not want to do that. A, a lot of learners ask, you know, why isn't that statement there? Well, it's it's a lot easier to enable it the way we're going to enable it. And, and this is actually something you could have done uh, under OSPF version 2. So we'll come into interface Ethernet 00. And all I need to say simply is IPv6, OSPF1, and then my area number. Well, Ethernet 00 is going to be an area 1. Ethernet 01 was an area 2. And actually, hold on one second here. So area zero, and you can see we have the adjacency pop up. Interface Ethernet one, and I can just recall the command, is in area two. We should have the adjacency pop up there with router three, and we do. Fantastic. So now let's get into the um, loopback interface, interface loopback zero. And we'll put that in area zero. Now we've got the serial interface. So before we go down the path of the serial interface, take a look at what we have out here with that serial interface. Right? We've got a frame relay network out here. And we talked about the OSPF network types in class this week, where we talked about the broadcast and the non-broadcast, and how 
those are the only two where you're going to have a DR and a BDR elected. Then we talked about point to multipoint. We talked about point to multipoint non-broadcast. We talked about point to point. And those are three network types where there is no DR BDR election. Uh, and specifically, uh, the, the non-broadcast flavor is that we have to add in static neighbor statements in order to get uh, the adjacency to form depending, again, you know, depending on what type of medium we're running across. So before we deal with that serial interface, let's say do show IPv6 OSPF neighbor. Again, the same as the, uh, the OSPF version 2 command. We just put v6 after IP. So there's my neighbors right now. If I say do show IPv6 OSPF database, right, you can see that we've got some new entrants here into the link state advertisement setup, some different LSAs here. We've got a type 8, and I've always found it interesting that they say this is the link LSA, and they say type 8, but then here they say intra-area prefix link states, and that is the type 9. And I'm wondering if Cisco thought, well, you know, what's going to come after 8? It's obviously going to be 9, uh, or if there's some other reason that they just don't put, like, type 9 in there. And the same thing up here when we start to talk about inter-area prefix link states. Why doesn't it simply say type 3 or network link, link states, type 2 or router? You know, to actually put that in there like they did right here would have made it much easier, right? Much easier for the learner. All right, so there's our OSPF uh, link state database on router 1. Again, remembering that router 1 is maintaining an individual link state database for each area to which it's connected right now. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So uh, we also want to take a look at the do show IPv6 route. Right. So there's our routing table. If I were to trim it down to the OSPF, we're basically picking up a prefix from router two. I'm sorry, from router three, and then from uh, area zero uh, that we're in here uh, from router four. And again, we're on the ABR. So that's why the ABR says these are intra not inter, but intra-area OSPF routes. Because, again, the ABR has an interface in each of these areas. So to the ABR, these are intra-area routes. All right, so now let's dig in here. Uh, and if you're following along, we're in step or on step four, where we're going to take a look at the non-broadcast multi-access serial interface here on router 1, between router 1 and 2. So let's come over to router 2 and let's see what router 2's got going on here. So we're going to say show run section OSPF. And what we notice immediately is how is this set up? This is actually set up with OSPF v3 with address families. But you'll notice it's using the new syntax under the interface. And that is the new uh, you know, sort of the Uber syntax for OSPF v3 with address families under the interface, you no longer say IPv6 OSPF uh, area, you know, whatever the area number is, in order to enable it under the interface, you say OSPF v3. And the reason you have to say OSPF v3 is because now you have to indicate, is this going to be doing IPv4 or IPv6 or both, right? So we need to make sure that we're clear on that and we'll, we'll step into that here shortly. But we really want to take a look at the interface, show run interface, I think it's serial 00 here. So there is the interface and you can see we're doing both IPv4 and IPv6. Clearly a frame relay interface, right? With the broadcast command at the end. But how does OSPF see this interface. So show run uh, or show, what am I trying to say here? Show IP OSPF or show IPv6. Show IPv6 OSPF interface serial 20. Or I'm sorry, 21. Interface serial or serial 00. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. So when we take a look at this interface, we can see that it's being treated as a non broadcast multi-access interface, right? And so frame relay by default will have a network type there of non-broadcast. 
And that's how OSPF is viewing this interface. So remember, with non-broadcast, that means there are no broadcast capabilities from an OSPF perspective, you know, irrespective of the fact that we have this broadcast statement here. By virtue of the fact that OSPF comes up and says, hey, I recognize this is a frame relay interface, and I'm going to go ahead and say it's non-broadcast. So what about over on router 1? Do show IPv6 interface, or do show IPv6 OSPF interface serial 20 over here. And we, ha we haven't enabled it under the interface 20, so let's do that. Interface serial 20, I was like, hold on a second, it should be there. So here's where we would say IPv6 OSPF area, and that is going to be, what area was that, 2? Area 1. All right, so we say area 1. Uh, IPv6, OSPF, oh, sorry, process ID, 1, area 1, there we go. All right, so we've got that in there. Now we're going to run that, do show IPv6 OSPF interface brief, er, interface serial 20, and what do we see? Exactly, right? Frame relay, it's going to say it's non-broadcast. So what do I need to do here? If we come back over and look here, uh, you can see, do I have any neighbor statement on the interface here, right? So no, there's no IPv6 OSPF neighbor statement to fire up that, that, um, that adjacency, right? So th we've got a couple of options here. I could hard code the interface over here, and I could say, uh, what are we going to do? IPv6 neighbor... Is that right? No, I'm sorry. IPv6 OSPF neighbor. And it was router 2 is FE80 colon colon 2. And so I could hard code uh, the IPv6 OSPF neighbor statement in there. Uh, and what this is going to do is this is now going to send a unicast. But what's the problem? So is the adjacency coming up? Do you show IPv6 OSPF neighbor? And you can see, and now for the first time, you get to take a look at the neighbor state that does not show up, or I, I believe it, it might be in the official certification guide, but in the foundation learning guide, we don't see the attempt state, I don't believe. So the attempt state is a state that you will only see uh, on non-broadcast medium. And so it's attempting to set that peering up. However, if we take a look over on router 2, do we have a neighbor statement over on router 2? Let's take a look. I don't believe we did. So if we roll back up, IPv6 OSPF neighbor, it's not there, right? So what I'd have to do on this side is go into global config, get into the global config and say interface serial 00, IPv6, OSPF, uh, and now I'm drawing a complete blank. Oh, wait a second. There, it finally came up. So we only need it on one side, or am I looking right at it and I just don't see it there? Let's, or is it under, hold on, do you show run section OSPF? Is it under the name mode? Oh, I see. Okay, so <laughs> here's the problem. All right, so they made the network type point to point, but I don't see, is that under the right interface? Hold on one second here. Let me make sure that's under the right interface. Yeah, that's not the interface that they are declaring point to point. Do show run. Let me see what they're doing here. So we've got, ah, they've made the loopback interface point to point for IPv6. Okay, so yeah, so it looks like we only need that static definition to show IPv6 OSPF uh, neighbors that we only needed it on one side. And remember, point to point and po point to multipoint do not elect a DRBDR. All three other network types, broadcast, non-broadcast, and point to multipoint non-broadcast those all do elect a DR and BDR. And so router 2 is saying, yep, I am fully adjacent. 
our link state databases are synced up between myself and router one, and I see router one as the BDR. So what does router one see? And it's probably not a bad idea uh, to come into interface serial zero zero and say IPv6, and then uh, OSPF neighbor, OSPF neighbor, FE80 colon colon one. Certainly can't hurt to have that on both sides. All right. So let's go ahead now and take a look at do show run interface serial to zero. Oops, sorry, wrong router. Do show run interface serial zero zero. Can't get the interfaces in the router straight. So that's what our configuration looks like right now. Let's again take a look at the do show IPv6 uh, OSPF database. And so you can see we've got a lot more activity in the database now uh, because when we look at this, you can see that all of these are over here uh, behind router 2. So it's creating quite a mess in the link state database. And again, there's our new type 8 link LSA, the intra area prefix. And remember, uh, 3 and 4, the inter area prefix LSA. That is used to be called the summary LSA and is no longer called the summary LSA uh, with OSPF version 3. All right, so there we are. We're through the link state database. Uh, and then finally, the other LSA, the type 4 LSA, is the inter area router LSA uh, for ASBRs. So it's inter area prefix LSA for ABRs. That's our type 3. They used, we used to refer to that as the summary. And you still can. You can still call it the summary. But to be technically correct, we're talking about the IPv6 inter-area prefix LSA for ABRs and then the inter-area router LSA for ASBRs. And they serve the same function as they did with OSPF version 2. It's just that the names have changed, right? But the same function. And then the two new LSAs, the Type 8 and the Type 9. Now, this is by far the largest improvement in terms of stability and scalability are the type 8 and type 9 LSAs. Uh, and so you'll notice that those are new. And if I were to go ahead and say do show IPv6 OSPF database, and I'm not with the contact sensitive help, and so we're going to say uh, enter, and is it enter dash area? Uh, it's enter dash area something and I don't have the con context sensitive help. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and type end and say show IPv6 OSPF database inner area prefix. Ah, should have known that. Inner area prefix, right? So if I hit enter, this is going to show me the inter area prefix link states, right? And remember uh, that actually the inter area, these are going to be my type threes. I want intra. Sorry about that. And let's see, there should be an intra. No, show IPv6 OSPF database. And we want not the inner area. I think we can actually just get away with saying not self-originate prefix internal intra area prefix link state. Yes, there we go. So here we're taking a look at the intra area prefix link state. And so these are my type nines, right? So these are the type nine LSAs. And you can see right here, intra area prefix LSA. And the type eight is the link LSA. And so the type eight has link local scope. So it's not sent or received off of the local link. And the type 9 has the prefix and the prefix length. So what has been done here is that when they rewrote OSPF version 3, they have completely removed the IP addressing. So they've decoupled the IP addressing from the type 1 and type 2 LSAs. And so you might be asking yourself, well, you know, what benefit does that provide? All that does is create two more LSAs with different names that are with new names that I now need to remember. But remember this, this is the most important thing, is that 
with OSPF version two for IPv4, uh, if you were to take down, you know, a loopback interface, a non-transit segment, in other words, right? So you're advertising a network uh, that's not a transit link. When you take that interface down, that is going to result in a full SPF run. So a, a full shortest path first algorithm run because the type 1 LSA of that router is going to change. And then it's going to have to flood that information all throughout the area. And then if there's ABRs, then those ABRs might have to then flood a type 3 summary out to provide updates, right? And so it causes all kinds of ripples or waves throughout your OSPF domain. So when they did OSPF version 3, they said, well, we're going to extract that IP address information from the type 1 and type 2 LSAs. And we're going to create two new LSAs called a type 8 to, to worry about the link local addresses and a type 9 to worry about the other IPv6 addresses, global unicast, unique local, so that if I were to take down a non-transit OSPF version 3, like a stub network, it would see it as a stub network. If I were to take that down, it's not going to result in a full SPF run. And so if you think about it, it's actually ingenious because really the only time you need a full SPF run is when one of the transit links has kind of gone offline or gone haywire. Now, it's not to say that it's not gonna, there's not going to be an update. There will be an update, right? If I were to take this interface down right here, there would be an update, but it's not going to be a full SPF run. And when we're talking about three or four routers, like we're looking at here, not that big of a deal. When we're talking about three or 4,000 routers or 300 routers in an area, that could become a little CPU and a little process intensive. So again, we've got the two renamed LSAs, the type three, which was a summary, and the type four, which was the autonomous system boundary router. Uh, LSA, those have been renamed to inter-area prefix LSA for ABRs and inter-area router LSA for ASBRs. And the reason they say router LSA for ASBRs is remember, what is the type 4 providing you? Yeah, exactly. The type 4 is simply like, you know, you see those guys that are standing on the corner for the furniture stores and they've got those arrow signs and they're wheeling them around and they're showing you how to get to the uh, the furniture store. That's your type 4 LSA. He's basically pointing his arrow sign to, hey, here's how you get to the ASBR. So I'm just trying to help you get to the ASBR. And then once you get to the ASBR, then they can get you to that external routing information, right? Or I should say that external destination that you're trying to get to. All right, so now we're going to talk about OSPF v3 for IPv4 and IPv6. In other words, OSPF v3 with address families. Now, the keys here in the lab, and just to sort of reinforce this, a single OSPF process is running. So right now, if I was doing OSPF version 2 and version 3 on this router, I'd have two distinct mutually exclusive OSPF processes. The OSPF version 3 address family mode consolidates that into a single OSPF process. Remember before, uh, I said you'd have multiple link state databases, one for the IPv4, one for the IPv6. This address families consolidates it, right? We've got, uh, and when you do your settings, just like name mode, the settings are specific to the uh, address family. All right, so I'm on step seven, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and on router one, we're going to convert this configuration very similar to when we did the uh, router EIGRP5, right, if that was the autonomous system number we were using. And then we said EIGRP upgrade dash CLI. And that converted my IPv4 configuration, uh, I should say my classic mode, 32-bit mode, classic mode EIGRP configuration, that converted that configuration to the EIGRP named mode configuration. 
and it sort of happened auto magically. So now let's go ahead and do the same thing. So with OSPF version 3, I say router OSPF whoops, v3, and then I give the process ID. And again, locally significant, so we'll change it to, well, it's 11, so we'll say 1111, right? We'll do four ones. And I hit enter. So what do you think is going to happen? So I put 1111, and it doesn't match the existing process ID. So if I were to say, do show run section router, what do we have? We now have two distinct sections. So in order for me to take advantage of that conversion, I'm going to say no router OSPF v3 1111. Whoops. And we're going to come back and say router OSPF v3 1. Right? So let me go ahead and set the router ID here to 1.1.1.1. And we're going to passive interface default. And then I'm going to say no passive interface uh, for, and you can see here, that and this is a result of the no of the, of the passive interface default command. That's not as a result of me typing in router OSPF v3 one. So what I would say is no passive interface on Ethernet 00. Whoops, Ethernet 00, Ethernet 01, and serial 20. And now we're going to have our adjacencies with router two, three, and four should come back. And you can see here, we went uh, the attempt, right? It went from attempt to down. And so we're going to see why here in a second. But what we want to look at now is when I say do show run section router, you can see that we, what happened before, right? So let's, let me scroll back up here before. So here, what happened? Did it get rid of that section? No, it didn't. Because the process ID I put in was different. I have to put the same process ID in for the conversion, right? For the conversion. It does not have to match between OSPF neighbors. And when I do, it automatically rips out the old configuration section. And now we've got a new configuration section. So if I were to say, do show IP v6 OSPF neighbor, you can see that we're now back, right? We came back with router two. And again, that attempt, you typically, we haven't seen that yet, but remember that is an, another state, but it is a state that only exists between non-broadcast capable, where you're actually statically defining a unicast neighbor is what you're doing. And that's where you would see attempt. Okay. So we are now, where are we at here? All right, so let's still take a look at the routing table. So do show IPv6 route OSPF uh, on router one. And you can see that we do not see all the routing information that I anticipate we would see. So we're supposed to be seeing much more than that and all of it from router two. So let's see, do show IPv6 OSPF neighbor. Ah, and we show down on this side, interface serial 00. We'll say shut. And let me bring the interface back up here. No shut. And so it showed us in the two-way state, right? When we were over here. Oops, sorry two-way druther. So all I did was take the interface down on the router two side and bring it back up, kind of kickstart things. And now we went back to where we should be, which is full DR, right? Which is full DR. And so now I'm going to see all that routing information here. So do show IPv6, route OSPF, and there we go. Now we have that routing table that's just flooded with entries here. So again, to sort of drive home uh, the optimization phase, if I look at the do show IPv6 OSPF database, we're going to see the same thing. The database has tons and tons of prefixes listed here uh, that we're getting from router 2. And so what's one thing that we can do in order to optimize this behavior? Exactly. We could do a summarization. So before we get to the summarization, we're on, if we're looking here at step 10, they want us to go ahead and if I were to say do show run include 
um, or actually do show run uh, section OSPF. And you'll see we have all these legacy statements because again, these continue to work, right? You'll notice we're doing address family mode and I'm still typing do show IPv6 OSPF neighbor or do show IPv6 OSPF interface brief. And those commands will continue to work. However, the quote unquote, you know, new Uber way to do it is to get under the interface loop back zero. And now you're not going to say router OSPF v3. You're simply going to say OSPF v3. And then what area, or I'm sorry, what process, and then the address family, there's a little bit more going on here, uh, IPv6, and then the area, area 0. So OSPF v3, 1, IPv6, area 0. So we did that on the loopback interface. So do show run interface loopback 0. Take a look at that. So it even cleaned up the legacy entry for me. So if I were to say do show run um, uh, section OSPF, you can see that now we have the new way to represent it. But both will work. Both will work. But it's a good thing to do this because if somebody just takes a quick glance at the interface, they'd be able to determine by seeing that OSPF v3, they would determine immediately, oh yeah, they're doing OSPF with address families. All right, so let's clean up the other interfaces. So interface Ethernet 00, and we can simply pull that command back because that's in area 0. We get into interface Ethernet 01, which I believe is area 2. Let me check that before. Yes, area 2. And then interface serial 20, which we know is in area 1. Now, what else do you notice? Did we see from, from full to down, and then it come back and go from loading to full after it transitioned through the other states, right? The init, uh, the e uh, sorry, the init, the two-way, the ex start, the exchange, and then loading to full. Do we see that activity. No, we don't. So this is fully 100% online. And so you this is something that you could do in a production environment. You would just have to make sure that you've got IPv6 everywhere that you need IPv6. Okay, uh, so we've enabled it there on... all of the routers. So step 12 is basically asking us to go ahead and get into the address family uh, or to enable things for the IPv4 address family. And so it's very simple. If I go to interface loopback 0, again we say OSPF version 3, the process ID is 1, and then we're going to go ahead and say IPv4. And did I? I'm hoping to show run interface loopback zero. Did I not say IPv? Okay, good. Just making sure that I said the same thing. OSPF, or that I did not say IPv4 initially. So OSPF v3 one, IPv4 area zero. We'll get into interface Ethernet zero zero, because that's also an area zero. Interface Ethernet, and you can see that now our peerings are coming up over IPv4 in in. in interface Ethernet 01, and that is in area 2, and then serial 20, and that is in area 1. All right, so we've got that added in, but now let's get back into that uh, router, OSPF v3, and then my process ID, which is 1. Address family IPv4 unicast. So again, this should be very familiar to you from EIGRP when we de dealt with name mode, right? You get into the process, you get into the address family, and then you start to make your changes. So here I would say passive interface default. Now what if I try to say router ID 1.1.1.1? We're good to go, right? So I can have the same router ID for IPv4 as I have with IPv6. And that appears to not be, did we actually set that? Do show run, let me make sure. Do show run section EIGRP, oops, not EIGRP, OSPF. All right. Uh, but again, remember, it's IPv6 is my transport here, right? IPv6 is the transport. So we said passive interface default. So we would want to come back and say no passive interface, Ethernet 00, Ethernet 01, and serial 20. There we go. So we should have our adjacencies now should pop back up here for us. 
and we'll be able to confirm that. We just basically say do show IP. Oh, actually, do show IPv6 OSPF neighbor, right? So everything is in the full state. So we've got all of our peerings up, but that do show IPv6 OSPF. That's sort of the old school. I can say do show OSPF OSPF v3 neighbor, right? And it, see how it breaks it down by address family. Again, it's a single process, a single link state database uh, for this router. And so the same thing, show OSPF v3 database. There is my link state database. And you can see for both IPv4 address family and as I scurry down here, and the IPv6 address family. Again, a single link state database, a single process. Uh, and so when you type in the OSPF v3, think of it as like your, the OSPF v3 is almost being substituted for IP OSPF, right? Because do show IP OSPF database. Now, is this going to show me anything? What do you think? Nothing. Why nothing? Show IP OSPF neighbor, nothing. Show IP OSPF interface brief, nothing. Because it's all IPv4 commands right there. Do you notice that? Those are all IPv4 commands for OSPF v2. And the reason I'm not seeing anything is because I have consolidated my link state database and everything for the OSPF process under a single process. OSPF version 3 with address families. But again, it's almost the, the do show, see where it says IP OSPF, you just simply substitute OSPF v3 interface brief. And there we go. Right? So just change where you would say IP OSPF, change that to OSPF v3, and you are going to be good to go. All right. So we already saw the routing table, and we know that the routing table is sort of a hot mess, right? So we're going to go ahead and do some summarization. And remember, OSPF, the link state database within an area, needs to be the same on all routers in that area. Okay. Uh, and so what we're going to do now is in summarization, that's why in OSPF we can only summarize at the ABR, right? The area border router. That's where we would do uh, our summarization. So the first thing we're going to do uh, is they would like us to change some of these areas into uh, it looks like totally stub areas. So we are in global config and we are actually in the address family but we need to be in address family IPv6 unicast because we're dealing with IPv6 um, with the IPv6 information. So I'm simply going to say area 2 stub no summary. Now remember the no summary is only required here on the ABR because it's the ABR that ultimately makes the decision. Yeah, it's a stub, but it's going to make the decision as to which information gets injected into this area. Whereas uh, if we were to talk about, and again, so whereas on the, the member router, right, which is going to be router two, all we have to say is simply stub. We could say no summary, but that's not going to change anything, and it would work with stub. So we say area 2, stub, no summary, and what happens? Now the bit, right, the stub bit has been set in the hello packets, and they no longer match between these two neighbors. So let's go ahead and sort this out. So we're going to say router OSPF, OSP, OSPF v3 process ID 1, address family IPv6 unicast, and we want to come back and say area 2 stub, and I'll put the no summary in there. Again, if someone were to look at it, they'd be like, oh, they're using sort of the Cisco secret sauce, a totally stub. And remember, the difference between a totally stub and a stub is that in a totally stub, there are no type 4s, no type 5s, no type 7s, no type threes, with the exception, do show IPv6 route OSPF, uh, with the exception of a default route, 
right, with the exception of a default route. And so let me take a look here real quick. Hold on one second. And did I do, and I certainly, does everybody see what I just did right there? So I did the correct thing here, right? I did the correct thing here, but then I jumped onto router two and ran that command, and I'm not supposed to be on router two. We're supposed to be doing this with router three. So let's say no area two stub no summary, uh, so that the adjacency will come back on router two. And router three that we haven't touched here, let's go ahead and get into global config. Uh, and we're going to say router OSPF, one, oh, no, I'm sorry, OSPF v3, one, address family IPv6, unicast. And this is where we're going to say area two, stub, and I'll throw the no summary in there. So again, back to the point I was making right before I realized that I was on the wrong router. Uh, so there we go. We've gone from loading to full, right? Because remember, we would have been down. So we're going to say do show... Uh, IPv6, or I'm sorry, yeah, do show IPv6 route OSPF. And again, so no type threes with the exception of this single default route. So no threes, no fours, no fives, no sevens, right? That is the totally stub. And the name reflects that, right? I mean, this is totally stub. You get a default route, that's it. Remember, with the regular, with the RFC compliant stub feature, you still get the type threes. You lose your fours and you lose fours and fives, and there's no sevens, but you still get the OIA threes if you're getting them from another area. Okay, so that takes care of the stub feature. Again, the air, the area types with OSPF v3 the same whether you're doing address families or not address families with ospf v3 we have the same area types stub totally stub not so stubby area and so and let me back up here so we have the stub which is rfc compliant then we have the totally stub which is the C cisco secret sauce then we've got the not so stubby area because someone said hey i need to uh, get external information into a stub area how do i do that well then we'll do it with a not so stubby area Right, because it's not so stubby because it is a stub, but it's letting us put type five information in there. Or I should say it's gonna be type seven and get converted to a type five, but it lets us put external information in there, it's probably better to say. Uh, and then we have the totally stub, not so stubby area, or commonly uh, you'll also hear sometimes people say not so stubby area, totally stub. It, they'll put the totally stub at the end, but it's totally stub NSSA or NSSA totally stub for that fourth and final area type. And basically, uh, that is also sort of a Cisco secret sauce area type, right? All right, so now we are down uh, to performing at the ABR at router one. Remember, we can't do it at router two. Router two is not in an area boundary. We're going to do a summary and we're going to do it of all that information right there. And so let's go ahead, and this is actually probably the last thing that we do here in this lab. So when we look at the information we have here, we're looking for the interesting hextet, which is here, and then we're looking for the interesting hex character within the hextet, and by interesting, we're talking about the one that doesn't match, and so it's going to be that one right there. Okay, so we've got 16 bits there that are going to match, 16 bits here, 16 bits there, and then 4 and 4. Let me double check, make sure that's good. Yeah, 4 and 4 for 8. So I've got 48, I've got 56, oh, look out, that was terrible. I've got 56 bits uh, that already match here. So how are we going to handle this? Well, remember, these are hexadecimal characters. So I need to get them into binary. And remember uh, that a hexadecimal character is just simply four binary digits. So zero would be zero, 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 zero. And then we have one, zero, zero. And in fact, we've got everything. We have all 16 here. So we've got zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, that's four. Five is going to be zero, one, zero, one. Six is zero, one, one, zero, seven, zero, one, one, one. And you get the idea. And then it's going to go all the way down to one, 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 one. So when we look at the bits, the binary 
bits that are broken out from each of these hex characters, where does it no longer match? And so it kind of makes it easy. That's why I skipped down here that F would be this in binary and 15 in decimal, right? 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 gives us 15. And so they, they don't match here, right? It stops matching. The bit position no longer matches universally here. So we know that it stops right there. Um, and so we have... And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm actually missing, yeah, I'm looking here. I, I thought there was, a thought. I, I guess I looked at the zero and thought that that was over there. So we're missing a zero. So we're actually at 60 bits. Because I was looking in here and I was like, wait a second, we're missing a character. So we're at 60 bits because the leading zero from this fourth hextet has been dropped using the rule of zeros. So we've got a slash 60 for our prefix length. And then what would that make the prefix? Well, it would be 2001 colon db8 colon and the last bit position that matched was the 2 2 and then there's no value after the 2 2 so it would be 2001 colon db8 colon 0 colon and if I put the 0 it would be 0 2 2 0 if I dropped it it would just be 2 2 0 slash 60 because again uh, we don't have any additional values that match there, right? There are no additional values that match here. So this is going to be my summary. 2001 DB8 0 220 slash 60. Okay. So let's jump on to router one. Remember, summarization is a little different in OSPF. We use the area range command, but remember router router OSPF v3 1 address family IPv6 unicast, right, we're doing it under the address family, we say area 1, because this is the interface that the ABR has into area 1, which is where this prefix information is coming from, and I'm going to say range, and I'm going to put down my 2001 colon db8 colon 0 colon 220 uh, colon colon slash 60, and that has now just summarized all of those addresses. But let's confirm this. Let's see. Do show IPv6. Well, actually, here, we'll come over to router 4 hasn't been used at all. So let's pull router 4 up here. We're going to say show IPv6 OSPF uh, database. And you can see that the inter area prefix link state, there it is right there. So take a look at that. We consolidated all of those addresses down to a single address. And again, remember the inter area prefix link state is the type 3, formerly known as the LSA summary, right? So formerly known as the summary LSA. And so there it is right there. So we see that it consolidated things here. What about the just simply the routing table? I could say show IPv6 route OSPF. And yes, again, we have a OIA summary that is representing all of those addresses. So if I were to try to fire off a uh, ping, and let me see here, the window is locked up on me. There we go. And let me just real quickly over here on router 2 do show IPv6, interface brief, and they all end in 1. Okay, good. So we're going to come back to router 4, and I'm going to say ping 2001 colon db8 colon 0 colon uh, we'll say 225 colon colon 1. And take a look at that. We've got full connectivity, right? What if I trace that address? Let's pull this back. Try to avoid typing the address in, and we'll say trace. And there we go. We go over to 14 colon colon 1, and then to 12 colon colon 1. So across uh, the links, the Ethernet link, and then out that frame relay link. And that is discovery activity number 14. Again, hopefully you've got a much better understanding of OSPF version 3. And the key takeaways here are, again, uh, RFC 5340 is OSPF for IPv6, but you can also, if you use that new syntax, right, uh, router OSPF v3 and then the process name, you can automatically convert that IPv6 configuration, legacy configuration, OSPF v3, into the address family configuration. If you take a look here, uh, this is a relatively, you know, 
I guess industry speaking, it's only six years old. So not that old of a feature, re relatively uh, new feature. Again, I don't see this a whole lot in production, uh, but if you were to put out a greenfield environment, uh, I would highly recommend going with OSPF v3 with address families and throwing those link local addresses uh, out on the transit links, establishing those adjacencies, and then just allowing IPv6 to communicate that IPv4 information uh, between the routers. Uh, and so this is going to wrap up discovery number 14. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you on Monday night.